The title of the message this afternoon is The Power of His Resurrection. The Power of His Resurrection. That comes from verse 10 of what he just read there in Philippians 3. And of course, the whole that whole chapter, just great, even talks about being conformed uh, to His glorious body. And a lot of it applies to uh, what I'm talking about this afternoon. But I'm mainly just looking at that phrase, the power of His resurrection. Now, this morning in Iola, the title of the message was The Glory of His Resurrection. And there are a lot of similarities, uh, some places where this sermon will even overlap with that in, in Iola. But there's a lot of similarities between the word glory and the word power in the Bible. And uh, I want to take a little bit of time here to look at some of those and just kind of show you what I mean by that. Oftentimes in the Bible, those two words are used together in the same verses and as an example, let's look at a few verses. Luke, we'll start in Luke chapter 4. This won't at all be exhaustive. We're just looking at a few examples here or samples. Luke chapter 4, verse 6. And this is actually the temptation of Christ here where after he's baptized, he goes to the, led into the wilderness and he's tempted of the devil. In verse 6 it says, And the devil said unto him, All power will I give thee, and the glory of them. He showed them the kingdoms of the world which he possessed. Okay, And he's like, I will give you all power of them uh, uh, unto thee, and the power of them. For uh, that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. Okay, so you see that glory and power used together there. Luke 21, uh, a few chapters over here. Luke 21, look at verse 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, talking about Jesus, whom being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had, uh, made, when he had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So we see in that uh, passage also the idea of the power of, and the idea of glory being in the same verse. Look at Revelation chapter 5. Again, just a little sampling here. Revelation chapter 5, look at verse 12. This is in heaven where the beast and the, uh, the angels there, the elders and all that are gathered around the throne are all joining in together. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. So he uses a lot of words there, but in those, in that list of words, he uses power, and he uses glory. And then in verse 13, he says the same thing, And every creature which is in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and upon the Lamb forever and ever. So, uh, so we see that idea of power and glory. And I thought of this as I was thinking about those two words. I thought about that passage in 1 Corinthians 11 where it talks about long hair on a woman. And it says that the hair, her hair is her glory. And then in that same context, it says, talks about the power on her head. And I thought, well, those two words are used uh, not synonymous, synonymously, but they're used together in that context, power and glory. And let me just tell you what I think the difference is. Maybe you already know this, uh, uh, but for me, this is just kind of uh, thinking this through and it kind of just clicked, all right? Glory has to do with praise and admiration that you give to somebody or that they are, that they are worthy of because of something that they possess or something that they do. The power is what it is that they possess or do, okay? So their power could be their beauty. Their power could be their strength. That's the common usage of the word power, right? Their, their power could be with their wealth. You know, uh, Solomon's power definitely was with all of his wealth and his wisdom, his knowledge. Uh, all these things are his power. And as a result of him having that power or anyone having power, then somebody else would look at that power and glorify 
what they saw. And so they would give glory unto that person for their power. So when we talk about the glory of the of Christ's resurrection this morning, I talked about what it is that is so worthy of honor, worthy of glory in his resurrection. And today we want to talk about that specific uh, power, the specific uh, uh, thing that the, that the resurrection produces that is worth, worthy of glory. Okay, so the power of his resurrection. Jesus receives glory for his resurrection. As I mentioned this morning, uh, he receives glory for these things. And this, this will come up in the, the different points, but here, here's what the basic outline was of the message this morning. He receives glory because not only did he lead a great life, show everybody how to live, he, he lived a sinless life, he loved others, he told others how to, uh, uh, how to live. Remember, he taught his disciples you know, how to love other people, even love the unlovely and love their neighbors, even love their enemies. And he showed that he didn't just tell them to do that, but he showed that he led the way. And uh, he he uh, remember before the uh, Lord's Supper, he washed their feet and he said, hey, if I'm your master and I wash your feet, then you ought to wash one another's feet. And he he showed how to be a servant and he led the way. He was a great leader. And, uh, you know, the world even recognizes him and gives him glory for that, even if they don't understand the gospel and they reject him as their savior. As a whole, I would say the world, even other religions of the world, would recognize Jesus as the great leader, a great prophet, a great man. Uh, I think, uh, let's see, who was my soul winning partner on... Uh, who went with me on? Was it Brother Austin? Yeah, was with me. And uh, we went into one of those houses. A, a lady was from Africa. And you walked in. And you remember the famous photo of uh, Brother Nick sitting down with, a, uh, with his cell phone. And he's presenting the gospel to this lady via a, a, a presentation online. And she was stopping him and telling him to go back. And she's writing notes. And, and, and the picture looks like it's straight out of Africa. Man, he's got like all these colorful wall hangings. And she's got her uh, West African garb on with the head headdress and the, and the long uh, uh, gown or whatever. And uh, broken English. And we met that kind of same situation. And we talked to this lady and she said she was Muslim and kind of was ready to close the door right after that. But somehow I was able to get her to keep talking and we started talking about her faith. And she actually said how she was open to listening to uh, teachings about Christ and everything. And she said uh, probably more than I've ever heard any Muslim say, she's like, oh, no, 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 no. We believe in Christ. We love Christ. She says the, the Quran, the Quran says you have to acknowledge Jesus was a prophet and that he would, I forget what the Arabic name for Jesus was, but you have to acknowledge he's a prophet. You have to acknowledge he's a good man and he's done all these things. You have to love him or else you can't even be Muslim. And she said, uh, there's all these uh, things about Christ that they believe in. They just didn't believe that he's the son of God. They didn't believe in the power of his resurrection. Okay. But they did glorify him because of the, some of the things he did on life. Uh, we also saw his glory. He, he receives glory because he demonstrated his absolute power over death whenever he resur when he rose from the grave. And uh, of course, that's uh, that gives us hope for our resurrection. And then finally, we, he receives glory because we preach the work of Christ on the cross, the finished work of Christ on the cross. We, pre we preach that. And it's so funny that anybody would ever want to talk about works for their salvation because uh, the gospel is actually preaching that, hey, it's just Jesus. He receives all the glory. We can't receive any glory for our salvation. We can't say, well, look what I did. Uh, uh, you know, look how, how much I was able to do for the Lord or how, uh, you know, I was baptized or I did this or my parents did that. No, no, you, you, nobody else in the world gets glory for your salvation except Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And so he receives glory from the resurrection. But we want to talk now about his power. What was so powerful about the resurrection? Number one, obviously his power to beat sin and death, okay? To beat sin and death. No other man, I, I realize he wasn't just a man. He was man and he was God, but he was 100% man, all right? He, that's why he had to come in, fle in the flesh. That's why he was born of a virgin. He did get hungry. He did get tired. He did uh, have all the feelings like a human has. He was even tempted in all points, right? Like, like, uh, like any man would be. And he had all that, but he was able to live a perfect life, resist any temptation. We read a little bit about that in Matthew 4. He was able to resist the temptations of the devil. And uh, 
And then finally, he demonstrates power over death. That was the conclusion of the whole matter. His whole life, and then he dies on the cross, and everyone is sad, and they're like, what happened? Why He was supposed to redeem Israel. Why did he go to the cross? Why did he do that? And then he rises from the dead, which he had told everybody he was going to do repeatedly, but then he does it, and it's like, oh, I see. I see now who he is. I see his power. I see. And it's like all things begin to, uh, to make sense. Romans chapter 6, verse 8 through 11 says, Now if we be dead with Christ... We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we don't get into heaven by our own power. We certainly can't defeat death on our own. But praise the Lord, we rely on him because he's already proven that he has power over death. And so he has power over sin. He has power over death. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's kind of like mocking the grave and mocking death uh, because God has the victory over it. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And, uh, and so if you take part in that first resurrection, well, how do you take part in that first resurrection? Well, anybody who's saved will take part in that first resurrection. Uh, people make this very confusing and they want to like say, oh no, that word means something else or whatever. But simply put, the resurrection is, is what is known as the rapture. Okay, The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the concept of going to be with the Lord and, and getting a glorified body and the dead in Christ rising first and all that is talking about the resurrection. Okay, The resurrection of the dead. And so if you take part in that first resurrection, you don't have to worry about the second death. You don't ever, you'll never taste of death because you are in Christ and Christ has power over death and praise the Lord for that. So, uh, so you won't have to worry about that. So the old adage goes, you know, if you, if you were born once, you die twice, you have to taste of that second death. But if you're born twice, meaning you're born to the flesh and then you're spiritually born or born again, then you only have to taste of that first death, right? Which is kind of like the Bible talks about sleeping or, you know, dead in Christ. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, you're, kind of, you're kind of still living by Jesus' definition because spiritually you never died, okay? You won't ever have to taste of, of the death because Jesus, ha- he conquered death, okay? Number two, so the power of his resurrection is simply that he beat sin. He beat death. He, he displayed power over that. Praise the Lord for that. Also, he, dist- he, uh, he has the power to draw men unto himself. Now, we, we sometimes don't comprehend that. And, uh, and we think, well, we've got to figure out how to really just sharpen up our gospel presentation. We've got to really figure out how to be wise and crafty in the way we present. Maybe our literature has to be a little bit more appealing you know, and more professionally done and, and we got to dress a certain way or not dress a certain way. And, and look, I'm not saying any of those things are necessarily wrong. We should present ourselves well. We should try to look our best. We should try to have good material to, to hand out and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, none of those things will bring somebody to Christ. What brings somebody to Christ? The power of the gospel. Christ actually draws men unto himself. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. How do we lift up Christ? Well, we have to go preach what the Bible says about Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And when we preach that, he will draw men through the power of the Holy Spirit unto him. Look at at, uh, Luke 24. Luke 24, this uh, is a verse I read this morning. In verse, uh, starting in verse 46. Luke 24, verse 46 says, <clears throat> this is after the uh, road to Emmaus and uh, their eyes began to open and they began to understand some things. And he says, uh, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins 
should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've had this verse quoted to me to prove that you need to preach repentance and people need to repent of their sins and they need to be converted and be saved. And the thing is, that would mess up the whole context of what we're reading right here. Because he's saying, hey, I had to die, I had to be buried, and I had to rise again so that you could go out and preach. And what are you pre preaching? What are you preaching? You're, re you're preaching repentance, right, for the remission of sins. Now, what are you repenting from? Well, whatever it is that they thought they were trusting in to get them to heaven, whatever it was that they were believing in that wasn't good enough, they have to turn from that and they have to say, oh, all my trust has to be in what Jesus did and the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that alone for my salvation and not, uh, you know, whatever else they're trusting in. That's what that repentance means. And when you put your belief and your trust in Jesus Christ alone, the Bible says you have remission of sins. Right. Amen. So it's not like, well, I just, every time I mess up, I just got to get there and pray and cross my chest or whatever. I got to do these special things and maybe God will forgive me. Look, if you're a Christian, your sins have been forgiven. That's right. They're under the blood. You're going to heaven whenever you die. Now, look, in this life, we want to have fellowship with God and we want to try to live right and we want to please our, our heavenly father. And so in this life, you reap what you sow, all those kinds of things. Yes, live right. Uh, if you if you fall into sin, repent of that sin. OK, don't do it anymore. Pray to God, ask forgiveness of the sins. Yes, all those things. But when it comes to your eternal salvation and the power of the gospel and God, Jesus drawing men unto himself, all that comes from this idea of saying, you know what? It's not me. Why? Because, again, if it was about you, you could get the glory for it. If there's anything you could do or how good of a, you know, this is why I, I remember growing up, I uh, sometimes would hear somebody say, well, if so-and-so put his trust in Jesus Christ and he's saved. And they would say, well, 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 we'll see. We'll see. Let's watch him a little bit and see if it was true. If it were, well, the only way it wouldn't be true is if you came back the next day and said, hey, man, you still saved. And they're like, I don't know. I don't really know. What do I have to do to be saved? I can't remember. Well, then obviously they weren't saved. They never understood it and trusted it and put their trust in Jesus. All right. But if they if, if they come back and say, well, yeah, I'm still saved. But you know what, man, I wasn't saved 24 hours and I fell right back into sin. Who cares? <laughs> I mean, don't do that. You'll mess up your life. But you know what? That has nothing to do with your salvation because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He gets the glory, not you. Not you. Now, what the, what's so amazing, what's such a miracle is that Jesus Christ would save you uh, in your condition. He would save a wretch like me. He would save a wretch like you. I mean, that's, that is something that's worth us uh, uh, wanting to give, give the Lord our life and serve him the rest of our lives. His power to draw men unto himself. When we preach the gospel, we should preach it in let God do the work. Okay, uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2. I'll skip the next verse. 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians two says, and I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words or of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The power of the gospel is simply in the gospel itself. It's not in the presentation of it or, or how we go about doing it, uh, but it's when the Holy Spirit begins to do the work after the gospel is preached, and uh, that's where the power is. We need to trust that. We need to trust that. I remember uh, at the uh, Focus on Evangelism conference, Brother Chris Miller came, and he used the he used the illustration of dynamite and he was saying you know if uh if he hooked up something uh to you know whatever that mechanism is that they use and they and they they pump that up and the dynamite explodes he said nobody in their right mind would say wow did you see how powerful i was 
you know, because they know that power was in that dynamite itself. And he just had to get as far away as he could and just let the dynamite do its thing and be dynamite. OK. And when we preach the gospel, we need to do as best we can to just kind of stand out of the way and let God do the work on the individuals. <clears throat> We're just there as an instrument, you know, to lead them to Christ and give them the opportunity to receive uh, the gospel. But finally, his power to save us from sin and death. Again, aren't you glad that your salvation and your, your ability to keep yourself saved isn't up to you? You know, you don't have the power. This is, I don't understand. I hear it all the time. Say, well, you know, you, it's just faith that gets you saved, but then you got to keep doing that work to keep yourself saved. doesn't make any sense. You never had the power to save yourself. You certainly don't have the power to, to keep yourself saved. Uh, this is something only the God gives us that power to do. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. By the way, I, I use that word that preachers use sometimes. Finally, I still have another point, so just disregard it. Mark that from the record. Strike it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. I'm so used to having three points. He says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. What seals you? Well, you're sealed by the Spirit of God. You can't save yourself. Look at 2 Corinthians uh, 1. 2 Corinthians 1. Verse 22. Oops, I'm in 1 Corinthians. Second Corinthians 1 verse 22 says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Okay, We're sealed until the day of redemption. In the meantime, we've got the Holy Spirit as that earnest or the kind of down payment is the way I've heard that explained. Uh, until the day that we are actually redeemed. And uh, we, have, we don't no longer have this sinful flesh, but we have the whole deal, the glorified body and the whole package. Okay, Sealed by the Spirit is what the Bible says. But then what about, uh, what about Jesus? We talk about Jesus, uh, you know, saving power. Well, look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 28. It says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So not only are you sealed by the Spirit, but Jesus says you're sealed in his hand, and metaphorically speaking, you're sealed in Christ. He's got you sealed, okay? But then look at the next verse. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And that's a real great illustration if you think about it. Hey, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're sealed by the Son. We're sealed by the Father. I mean, we've got the whole Trinity involved in uh, sealing us and saving us until the day of redemption. Now, uh, it's interesting, compared that to, and I don't think that I wrote this down in my notes, but uh, compared that to the actual resurrection. Let me see if I wrote this down. I don't think I did. I didn't write this down, but uh, I've, I, I meant to. I have got the verses, uh, but if we look at in the Bible where it talks about Jesus rising from the dead, it can be confusing. And like the Jehovah's Witnesses say, you know, that, that God the Father rose him from the dead. But then you're like, wait a minute, there's other verses that say, you know, I have the power to lay my life down and I have the power to take it up again. And there's other, other verses where he used where it says Jesus rose up from the dead, like on his own, in his own power, he rose up from the dead. You're like, well, who was it, the Father or was it the Son? And then there's other verses that say the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit, you know, which raised him from the dead. Look, you realize when you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about God. All right. And God is a triune God, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. You say, oh, that's a plurality of gods. That's not a plurality because God is singular. OK, but he's a God uh, that exists in three persons. You say, explain that to me. I can. OK, that's the best I can do. <laughs> the Trinity is, is, is a little bit hard to 
to, uh, cons to, to understand in our mind. But aren't you glad that it's hard to understand God? <laughs> if God was easy to understand, I'd be suspicious. You know what I mean? But, it, but the Trinity is involved in the whole resurrection and all the events that happen there. The Trinity in, is involved in keeping you saved and stealing you into the day of redemption. But in the end, God gets all the, all the uh, glory, right, for that power. It's not, no power of our own. And, uh, of course, we, he created us so we couldn't even be here uh, without his power. Okay, so fourth point is this, and then I'm done. His power to change us. All right, let me give a real quick recap. The power of his resurrection, okay, means the power to beat sin and to beat death. It means the power that God has to draw all men unto himself. The power uh, that he has to save us from our sin and to save us from death. And the power that he has to change us. Okay, what do we mean to change us? Well, look at 2 Corinthians. Again, <laughs> we've been back and forth. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians five. Now I'm going to read this and then I'm going to explain it. Okay. So don't get ahead of me. Second Corinthians five. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I've heard people quote that verse and in quoting that verse, what they have tried to show is that, look, if you are saved, your life will change. Now, I tend to believe that if you're saved, your life's going to change, and I'll get to that in a second. But my uh, knowing or believing if somebody is saved or not saved should not have anything to do with, well, let me just watch them and see how much they change. Okay, because the change that's being referred to is not an outward change. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, he says that all things have become new. Well, let me ask you this. When you got saved, did all things become new? I mean, I, when I got saved, I really didn't look any different. In the manner of speaking, I didn't feel any different. I mean, there was something in my heart where I felt, you know, I, I knew I was saved. There was an assurance of my salvation, but I didn't really feel that, that different, you know. I didn't necessarily look any happier. I mean, I think I was smiling and I wanted to tell people about it, but I mean, there wasn't some great change. I mean, really, I was like seven, eight years old, there wasn't really that much to change. <laughs> Some great sins I was involved in or something like that. Because our salvation has nothing to do with the change. Okay? So when he says, if you're in Christ, you become a new creature, guess what? That creature is a spiritual creature. That creature is the, the creation that is inside you. That's the inner man. All things have become new in that inner man. That inner man is now spotless. That inner man is saved and he's sealed by the blood of the lamb. And he's spotless. He's without blemish. He'll one day go to be with the Father and praise the Lord. We'll get a glorified body, but this body is never going to be sinless. And this body is always going to be corrupt. And this body has to be destroyed. Okay, so that change is in the inner man, okay? And we understand that. We know that, uh, that it's in the inner man. We understand. Back to Romans 6. I was reading it earlier. Romans chapter 6. And I think I left off on uh, verse 11 where it says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves, okay, so there has to be a reckoning or a, or a uh, acknowledging, okay, uh, remembering that you're in Christ because it's not just something that's just naturally you're just going to constantly live in Christ. You have to remember that you're in Christ and you have to think about that. Look, at start in verse 9 again. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he, diet, he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus, uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. It doesn't say it won't reign in your mortal body anymore because you're saved. No, no, no. It's our job to reckon. It's our job to, to, to work at it and not let it reign in us. 
Okay, and so I'm not saying that when somebody gets saved, then oops, it just it's all God. God's just going to change our life. No, because of the way in which He made us with free will and all that kind of stuff, it's up to us to decide to walk in the new man. Okay, but that new man's there. The new man's sealed. The new man's going to heaven no matter what. But it's up to us to reckon that we're in Christ and to remember and to mortify uh, the old man and all that. But Having that new man and having the spirit dwelling inside of us, that's a big deal. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty much everything to walking in the Christian life and being a Christian is having that new man in you. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 30. Another verse that confuses people about that, that scary word, predestinate. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, I'm going to preach a series on Calvinism here pretty soon, okay? Some things have happened that kind of make me feel like I have to do that, okay? Against Calvinism. <laughs> don't, get, don't get worried. I have to preach some, uh, uh, some messages on that here, here recently. And I'm not going to take the time to explain this right now, but here's what I want you to know. God has got a plan. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are one of the elect, okay? Because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And he has given you that spirit inside you. And he's given you all that you need. And in the church, he's given you prophets and teachers and, 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 uh, and pastors. And he's given the things that, to equip you. He's left us with his word. He's given you all that you need to be conformed to the image of Christ. And it says right here that you will be, he's predestined you to be, uh, let's see, and those who he's, pre, who he's predestined, look, uh, verse 30 here, who he did predestinate, he called who he called, he justified whom he justified. Uh, and then it says, them he also, what's the last word? Anybody reading along? Verse 30, glorified. The, and the end result is glorification. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got no power. We already said, none of the power is mine. It's all God. I don't get any glory. God gets all the glory. But yes, 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 wait a minute you do at some point receive glory. But only whenever you're walking in, in, in Christ. Only whenever His good works are showing, the, showing through you. The Bible says uh, uh, that you should uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, You're just part of that glory. Why? Because you're in Christ. You know, he, you're, you're only doing the works of your father and you will receive glory for that. Last verse, look at Ephesians chapter three. It's all about the power of his resurrection, the saving power, uh, his power to draw men unto himself and, and all that. He even has the power to change us as his children to be conformed to the image of Christ. And in the end, you can and you will be glorified through Jesus Christ who's in you. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. There's several verses going through my mind right now that, that I could take you to that show that we will receive glory. We will receive glory. But look only because we're part of that, that plan, because ultimately that glory is being reflected onto Christ. All right. And that, and, and once you get that, and I talked about this in, uh, on Thursday night, and I talked about in being enlarged. Okay. The more you can be like Christ, the more you can be separated from the world, be distinctly different from the world, the more God will allow your ministry to grow and allow you to, uh, your, your coast to be enlarged was the phrase that I used. And he will enlarge your coast and allow you to do greater things for him, right? Which is the great blessing. It's the great success 
that we're all looking for. Now, we think of success in the flesh, and we think of money and fame and, and everything that we want to just fall into our land, have the right job and right, have the right uh, you know, uh, family and have the right you know, things in this world and all that stuff. But that's not the blessings that God wants to bless you with. He wants to bless you with spiritual blessings that you can then uh, use towards Him to bring Him more glory. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. More fruit that we can, we can uh, bear for Him, the more He's glorified. Okay, so we want to be instruments, set apart instruments, holy instruments uh, uh, unto honor, you know, that will glorify Him. And that is what it's all about. Okay, so the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, what it always comes down to is in the end... He said, I will go to my glory. Okay, that's what Luke 24 said. He said, uh, he said I've got to be, uh, uh, let me go, let's go back there. I'll end on that one. I lied. One more verse. So Luke 24. And I think it's verse 26. Luke 24, verse 26. This is when he's, on the road, these uh, two of the disciples are on the, on the road to Emmaus, and they're and they're just sad, and they're like, hey, "Haven't you seen? Haven't you heard about the things that happened to Christ?" And and he says, "Oh, fool, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken." Verse twenty six: Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? What do you mean, enter into His glory? Enter, go to heaven? Well, not necessarily. He is in heaven, but he went to heaven and he entered into his glory. He's fulfilled all that he was supposed to fulfill. The work is done. Now he's in heaven. And like I said, he's glorified when we preach the gospel. He has the power to draw men unto himself. He said, uh, he said you will do greater works than I will do. You ever think about that? I've heard people try to say, Oh, see, he said we're going to do greater works than him. That means we're going to be able to do all these miracles and we're going to be able to, uh, you know, heal people and we're going to speak in tongues and we're going to do all this. You think anybody honestly thinks they're going to do better miracles, greater miracles than Jesus did? <laughs> I mean, he was perfect and he perfectly performed all miracles. That's not what he meant when he said you will do greater works than I. He's saying greater in number, greater in, in, in the, uh, the magnitude of it in this sense. The gospel of Jesus Christ, right, his work now has gone to the uttermost parts of the world. At the time of Jesus' death, pretty much his work had only, only pretty much stayed in that area, uh, contrary to what the Mormons teach, pretty much stayed in that Middle East, in that area right there. Okay, but he says, no, 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 I want to send you into the world. He says, by the way, all power is given unto me, he said. Then he said, go ye therefore. He's sending us in His power to preach the gospel, and He receives the glory for, for it all. We just take part in it. And I, that's enough glory for me just to know that I'm doing as much as I can for the Lord to bring Him glory. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for the power of the resurrection, and I pray that You'll help us to boldly preach uh, the gospel, knowing that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. I pray that You'll help us uh, to live as Christians are supposed to live, with their eyes and their focus on the power of the gospel and preaching it to others. Help us, Lord, uh, to live uh, in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and bring as much glory to you as we can. And we pray that you'll bless this church in that way and allow us to do that for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.